All right, so like I said, we're going to be going over the different types of alarms in Vikanet and how to set them up, how to react to them, and the different ways of being able to react to them. The idea being that Vikanet gives you a lot of flexibility, and you, you need to choose whichever way best works for you and whichever way is easiest for you to be able to handle the setup. Now, to begin with, there are four basic types of alarms in the Vikanet system. One of them is a dry contact, video loss, video motion detection, and there's also an external alarm which is sent directly to the events management system. However, we will not be discussing this during this webinar session. So we're going to concentrate on the dry contact sensor, the video loss of a camera, and video motion detection of a camera as well. We'll start off with the dry contact. Basically, some Vikanet products include the dry contact alarm. This can be from one contact and up to 16. Follow the specific unit's installation instructions on how to connect the contact. The idea being that you connect the contact to a fire system, fire alarm. You can even do it to a light switch if you wanted to. I'm sorry, <laughs> fire alarm, smoke detector, and the alarm coming in, rather, would be triggered on the system. The system would then be able to notify that that particular alarm went off, and then you'd be able to react to that alarm. Unit, units do not automatically recognize if the contact is normally open or normally closed, and this will need to be set up to prevent false positive detections. Now, you'll notice that we'll, when we go through the setup, you'll see that some you dictate which is normally open and which is normally closed, and there are some products that automatically detect that, and then whenever the, the state changed, then the alarm would occur. To get to the alarm setup, click on the setup button at the top of your screen. Everybody can see my setup site selection? Yeah. All right. Select the machine you want to set up. In this particular case, I'm going to go onto the collective force. And in here, I'm going to go into the alarms section. It'll show me the current configuration that is displayed. By default, you're going to have the video loss already configured for you but not the dry contacts. In the past, dry contacts had been previously defined, and it would automatically be whatever the state of the contact that was connected was. Nowadays, it's basically you have to dictate if it's normally open or normally closed, and since the system does not know that in advance, there is none pre-configuration of the dry contacts for you. All right, a collector, in this particular case, you click on Add Detector. And that's how you're able to add the detector. If the detector already existed, then we would have clicked on Edit Detector in order to change the configurations for that particular machine. Now, Collector will display an alarm window indicating the local contact alarm that occurred. An IP camera or IP video transmitter needs to be configured to send the alarm notification to a specific viewing station. We're going to learn how to do that later on as we set up the alarm itself. As I mentioned, if the alarm already exists, then select it from the list and press the Edit button. Otherwise, press the Add button to select the detector you want to configure. The alarm setup is a wizard-type setup, which means you are guided through the setup. <clears throat> At any time, you click on Next to continue. And if you ever need to go back to reconfigure something, you click on the Back button. In this particular case, we're going to select the sensor from the list. I'm going to start with sensor number one. Oh, let me start with sensor number two. Sensor number two, and then I click on Next. The sensor type, intrusion, motion detector, detector, smoke, perimeter, fire, other, these are just for informational purposes only. It does not really matter what you put in. It just pops up as part of the alarm later on. So I'm going to leave it at intrusion and click on the Next button. And this is where we di dictate the normal state for this particular alarm type. I'm going to make it normally close to have it in the list, and when I'm done with my selection, I click on the Next button. Here we get to Activity Time. Basically, the Activity Time indicates when notification will be sent if the alarm occurs. You can enable the alarm for up to three different date-time selections. As you can see, the default selection is 24-7. Basically, if I want it to be only during the weekdays, then I can take away check marks from particular days. And the way I have it set up now is that only Monday through Friday 
between 10.08 until 10.08 the following day, only if this alarm goes off during that time period will the system actually receive that notification and be able to react to it. In other words, if the alarm occurs on a Sunday, the system will not do anything. But if the alarm occurs between Monday and Friday, then on a collector at least, I would have the alarm notification pop up because that alarm would have been configured to pop up when the alarm occurs. Is that understood? Yeah. Any questions on the alarm activity time? Hello? Uh, no, no questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> I want to make sure I didn't lose the audio on anything. All right, I'm going to leave it back at the 24-7. And obviously the seven days of the week are the check marks and the 24 hours a day. As long as the active from time and the to time are identical, then it's a 24-hour period. At the bottom of the screen, you can select a minimum time interval between alarms. This means that a new alarm will only be recognized by the system when that much time has passed between the alarms. We'll press next when we're ready. But basically, the minimum time between alarms, if I don't want too many alarms to occur at the same time for that particular alarm, for example, a door contact, if that door has been opened, and once it's opened, I get the alarm, but then several people go through that door opening it each time within a short period of time, instead of getting a separate alarm for each incident, we group it up into belonging all to the same alarm, and then the alarm has to have at least one minute of free time before it's triggered again and I get notified one more time. Right, I'm going to click on Next. Related devices, we're going to cover that in the Advanced section later on, so we're going to skip it for now. So I'm just going to click on Next. And we get to the last section, which allows you to select a macro to run when this alarm is activated. If you do not have a macro ready, you can press the Macro Editor button from the Alarm Setup screen to enter the Macro Editor and create a macro. When finished, you will be directed back to the Alarm Setup screen and be able to select the new macro. Or if you don't have an alarm, or rather a macro that you want to be triggered from this alarm, you can simply click on the Finish button from here. <clears throat> Since this is an alarm contact, and we're going to actually more dictate time towards the Video Motion Detection section, that's when we'll start writing up macros and fully understanding all of this. But the point is that in this section here as well, I can select a macro from my list. If a macro does not exist, I can go directly from here to the macro editor and then create macros. And when I'm done, I'll be able to select it from the previous screen. And as I mentioned, we're going to concentrate on that when we do the video motion detection. But it all works the same way regardless of the different alarm that I choose to do. And once I'm finished, I click on the Finish button. The alarm is saved. And it pops up here at the bottom, sensor number two, as an intrusion alarm type. 